asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Ray McGovern. You know all about Ray by now. CIA analyst for decades. Um, Award-winning, very much the most decorated CIA officer there has ever been. Briefed six individual president, presidents, gave them their daily briefings. An honourable man. Well, last week, he was dragged out of the US Senate hearing, the confirmation hearing for Gina Haspel, who is Donald Trump's nominee for CIA director. Ray was dragged out despite being assured or being told by a, a senator who was at the dais or who was at the stage who said to him, uh, you can say what it is you want to say if you say it briefly. Just as he was beginning to say what he came there to say, Ray, which was presumably to charge uh, Gina Haspel or to demand that she acknowledge that she supervised the waterboarding of terror suspects at a black site in Thailand, just as he was about to say what he was about to say, Ray was dragged out and was injured. Uh, Five or six police officers jumped all over him. He was taken to court. He spent a day in the clink in jail. He was released and that is um, pending a further hearing. So he will be charged with disturbing the peace and he will have to go to court at some stage. RT covered it. Many alternative alternate or alternative news outlets covered it as well. We covered it, of course, and I gave him a shout over the weekend and I said, um, come back on the programme. Uh, he was on with us a few weeks ago, of course. So I asked him first of all, of course, how is he? This was his answer. Well, I, I'm doing well, actually. Um, the uh, good news is that uh, my shoulder did not get separated again. I, I have an old basketball injury that uh, uh, that I have to be careful about. It goes out under very little provocation, and there was a whole lot of provocation uh, on Wednesday. Uh, there's the bruises and cuts and lacerations, uh, but that's it. So um, I escaped uh, given what they could have done. I was saved, actually. Uh, for those of you who saw me on the ground there, uh, uh, they were twisting my arm and so forth. There was a, a young lady there with a iPhone taking video, and she said, you're hurting him. You're hurting him. <laughs> and that was all it took because the captain looked at her and had to decide, do I grab this young lady? Do I take her iPhone and throw it in the garbage, or, or do I do I do the sensible thing and tell him to stop? And he told him to stop. So, as long as you got somebody around to witness these things, there's a there's an off chance that they'll stop when they have uh, some kind of uh, person who has any sense, uh, like a captain of the police police there. That's what happened. So, worse could have been done. Uh, the uh, the instructive uh, part. Uh, Richie, you may appreciate this. I don't know if you've been in prison, but there was no no other than uh, none other than uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky who said that if you want to measure the level of civilization civilization that a nation has achieved, you need to go visit their prisons. You need to see how people are treated in prison. And for the next twenty seven hours or so before. Some judge let me uh, go to come back later this month uh, to face trial. Uh, for that 27 hours, I was given the opportunity that I, I say dead seriously, that every white American should experience. And that is to see how people who have been dehumanized, to see how people who have been put in the control of others without any supervision, without any respect, how they're treated. And of course, I was in there. There was one other white person uh, in with the 97 of us in these uh, six foot by eight feet little, uh, maybe 10 feet little uh, cells with two stainless steel bunks with nothing on them. So, you know, um, when I looked at the color of my skin on the inside of my forearm, and I said, well, McGovern, you're going to be out of here. It may take a while, but you're going to be out of here. But how about my brothers here? How about my brothers? Will they be out of here? And so it struck me one more time what white privilege really means. 
uh, it was bad enough I'd go through that, you know, big deal, 27 hours. But I knew I was going to get out of there. I, I may have to do some time later, but I wasn't going to be beaten or I wasn't going to be put. Well, I was put in shackles, actually, foot shackles as well as uh, arm shackles when they brought us up to the court. Another way of shaming people, I suppose. But I knew I was going to be out of there. And my brothers don't know they're going to be out of there. Many of them are back there and on no bail. And, and, and they'll be there for, for many days, if not weeks and months. So so it's an experience that everyone should uh, should have, I think, uh, to show how marginalized, uh, how, how it feels to be marginalized, even though. And, you know, this is uh, this is the big out, even though. When you look at the inside of your arm here and you see, ooh, it's pretty white. Now I'll be out of here. Uh, my brothers will not be out of here. And, you know, I strongly believe that they are my brothers. And uh, if we don't believe that, well, then we're, we allow ourselves to do things like torture people, to kill them, to shoot uh, butterfly bullets uh, at others as the Israelis are doing as we speak. 38 Palestinians killed at the Gaza border today, like today. as we speak and yeah. counting. I mean, what what is it that we that allows us to support Israel in, in that uh, in that hard the way they treat people? Uh, well, I tell you, you know, at the bottom of all this, Richie, I've learned in my old age, the word is racism. If you other other people, if you make them less than human, then you could do those things to them. If they don't look like you, you know, the Japanese, they didn't look like us. Um, the Iraqis, uh, the Vietnamese, uh, they don't look like most, most of us, all right? So it's a heck of a lot easier to do things, uh, horrid things, as Gina Haspel did, waterboarding, uh, to people who don't look like you than, uh, than to Germans who look like us or, or to others who, Israelis who look like us. So it's racism at the core, and that's our original sin. We started with the Native Americans, so we're doing a great job still. Witness what goes on in the United States prisons. You were there because Gina Hospital has serious questions to answer about her conduct and her time. And it's staggering. I know, I mean, we're, 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 we're recording this now. It'll go out later on, and people will be hearing it recorded. But, but you've got to go back in front of a judge to face a trial. For what, Ray? For standing up and asking questions that the mainstream media should be asking of this woman. Is that what you're being charged with? What, what is it? Is it disturbing the peace? I, I'm, I'm staggered to hear that you're going to be on trial for this. Well, uh, there are two charges, disrupting Congress and resisting arrest. Uh, I think we can d dismiss the, <laughs> the second one. For anyone who's, who's seen the video, um, let me just uh, say how this all evolved. At the very beginning, Richie, it was really quite bizarre. Uh, Richard um, Burr, a senator from North Carolina, who is the chair of this uh, Senate Intelligence Committee, started out by saying, no, we're going to have an open session here so the American people can see uh, the qualifications of this wonderful person. And, uh, and then we'll go into executive session. And I suppose there'll be somebody who want to make a statement that well, my advice to you is make it quickly, make it fast and be gone. End quote. <laughs> well, so McGovern's sitting there and he said, huh, <laughs> that sounds like a a very rare invitation to make a statement, make it quick and then be gone. So I may, I may have to do that. <laughs> well, and sure enough, after an hour and a half of bobbing and weaving and obfuscating, and uh, it was just really hard to just sit through, uh, Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon uh, asked uh, Gina Haspel, now Ms. Haspel, uh, uh, yes or no, were you, uh, were you in charge of the, uh, uh, the site in which Al Nashiri was waterboarded, uh, yes or no? Well, Senator, um, I can't really answer that because it's it's classified. Jesus. So I have to go into into closed session. Now, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, uh, Ron Wyden ran out of his time, you know. But his next question would have been, "Well, uh, Miss Haspel, who classified that information?" <laughs> and the answer, of course, would have been. Well, Senator, I did. I did, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, here you have somebody who's the head of, acting head of the CIA 
uh, classifying information. It's, it's available uh, in the National Security Archive. It's available in the press. It's available to every one of those senators. But she's classifying it because it's so damn incriminating. So hey, this, is a great, <laughs> this is a really great situation here. And uh, I've never seen the like of it. Now, what should have happened at that point, of course, is Senator Burr, who's joined at the hip with the CIA, what he should have said, is uh, now, Ms. Haspel, um, we all have the documents now. Uh, this is not a, a difficult question. Yes or no, did you supervise the waterboarding of Al Nashiri? And she would have to say either, okay, yeah, I did, or she'd have to say, well, Senator, I've, I've classified that, so we, we can't talk about it here. So what's going on here? The open hearing, right? The public hearing designed to let Americans know what kind of person this is, right? <laughs> what kind of person this is that, that Trump wants to make head of the CIA? She's allowed to slip away and not admit that she's, she's uh, uh, guilty of a war crime because she was indeed there. So long story short, uh, when the police officer who was standing in front of me I went to the bathroom or something. I got up and I interrupted one of the senators. And I said, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt, but here's my chance to, to say a word. And, uh, you know, Senator Wyden is, you know, he's entitled to a straight answer. And we all know that Gina Haspel was in charge. Whoops, all of a sudden, <laughs> four cops descend on me and uh, I couldn't get out the rest of my little statement. But, you know, uh, it was just so what well, the American people are being exposed to is far less than the truth and uh, so their senators will be get will, will my my fear is they may get away with nominating a person uh, whose uh, whose main uh, credentials are heading up the first black site to which uh, suspected suspected right suspected detainees in the war against terror were kidnapped that's the word for it we say rendered okay and were kept uh, uh, in prison and tortured. So uh, is this a great country or what? Well, it used to be, and we're trying to get it back on track. And I would imagine there are retirees such as yourself, men and women that you served with, absolutely aghast that this woman is likely to be confirmed, will be confirmed, undoubtedly, as the head of the organisation you served. We could talk about the memo, memos, but one memo that exists that talks about her destroying evidence, destroying tapes. These are the sorts of things that, you know, Joe, Joe Soap, Mr. and Mrs. Joe, Josephine Smith, if we were involved in this sort of stuff, we'd expect to be arrested and certainly precluded from, you know, getting anywhere near such a lofty position. She is going to be. Why do you think, Ray, knowing that, knowing who she is, why do you think they've opted for her? There must be easier options. I, I'm confused as to why they would want to go with her. Well, you're talking about Trump, of course. And when I'm yeah. asked to explain why Trump does things, I just have to throw up my hands and say, you know, you're talking about not only a, a, a wholly unpredictable person, but one whose motivations are hard to fathom. Now, she was a functionary. She's guilty of sin but she's being pushed up uh, up to the top of the bureaucracy uh, to make sure that just as she did on Wednesday, she obfuscates the truth and protects people like John Brennan and the other directors that came before her who uh, knew about this stuff, may, many of whom approved it. Uh, General Hayden, General Michael Hayden, you know, he was, these guys are felons and the best way you pr pr protect yourself from, from uh, getting the, um, justice you deserve is by putting up a functionary like this who if she if she succeeds in lying to this committee and the senate committee is is much more in bed with the intelligence community than the house committee uh then she'll get through and she'll be in a position to obfuscate to deny destroy records okay you know what most people don't realize or remember is that uh, the senate intelligence committee under the leadership of diane feinstein of whom I have no fan, but to her credit, she ran a four year investigation with very bright, committed investigators, and she got access to original CIA cables, memoranda, and that's what their investigation was based on. Now, 
it's really necessary to answer this question. How in the world did she get access? Did, did uh, uh, Dianne Feinstein and her committee, she was chair at the time of the Senate Intelligence, how she, how she managed that? Well, you know how? <laughs> because Gina Haspel and her boss, Jose Rodriguez, destroyed the interrogation tapes, 92 of which showed waterboarding and other heinous practices like, oh, like rectal feeding. Rectal feeding? There's never any medical indication for rectal feeding, for God's sake, and other things, put him in small boxes with insects that they're, you know, afraid of, all kinds of stuff. How did they, how did they get access to that? Well, all of the senators, except one, said, you know, we need to investigate this. And without thinking, they approved the investigation. And then, of course, as soon as it became clear that George Bush and Dick Cheney were, were war criminals, the, the Republicans ducked out so that they could accuse it of being a partisan effort. But after four years, they came up with this investigation. And just at the end, okay, as you know, our Congress changes hands every now and then. Well, yeah. at the end of 2014, there was to be a new Congress and the Republicans were gonna take over the Senate Intelligence Committee. So Dianne Feinstein was gonna be out of a job. At least she wouldn't, be, she wouldn't be chair of the committee. So why I say all this? Well, it was just about to be published. Barack Obama had supported John Brennan, the head of the CIA, tooth and nail fighting that this or that name be excised, but at least it had been redacted. It was ready to go. And all of a sudden, uh, the president says, well, no, we're going to push this over to the next Congress. Blah, 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 blah. So Diane, to a credit, knowing how what what her staffers had done, said to the president, look, Mr. President, uh, you got a choice here. Um, one of our members of our Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, Mark Udall from, from Colorado, he, he lost his uh, re-election bid, uh, but he's going to be around until January. This is December, okay, of 2014. He's going to be around until January. He's going to read, he's going to read the executive summary of these heinous practices based on original CIA documents from the floor of the Senate if you don't release this report. So you got a choice. Udall reads it or you released a redacted report. Well, you know, I don't know exactly what Obama did, but you know, I'm sure he called up John Brennan. Oh, John, the jig is up here. Uh, it, 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 we, have to, we have to release it. And so they did release it on the 9th of December, 2014. The rest of the story, the Senate committee did change hands. Senator Richard Burr from North Carolina took over. What's the first thing he did? He said, I, New, new chairman of this committee, recall all the copies, all five, six copies whatever they were, of the Senate investigation report, because that belongs to me, because it came out of this committee and I'm the new chairman, so I want all of those back. Now, guess who, guess who scurried down to the Senate to give the, her copy back the first, <laughs> before anybody else could react? You know, I'll bet it was Gina Haspel or one of her supervisors. So there you go. Uh, this, and this, corruption. This, this investigation from the very beginning, uh, this guy, Richard Burr, decided to, uh, well, we say deep six or, or just get, I don't know if there are any copies that remain. There's, there's said to be one uh, in, in the uh, Obama library, but Obama is such a coward that I'm sure he would look the other way if they wanted to destroy that one as well. Well, the, the corruption you've described is breathtaking. I can't be the devil's advocate and challenge any of what you said because it's true. I've got the memo in front of me here, the December 2011 memo about the destruction of tapes. Ray is right. Yeah, Ray, Ray is our, Ray McGovern is our guest. We, we don't have Ray for as much time as we ordinarily would have him for today. Um, I'm, I'm, it's great to catch up with him and um, great that battered and bruised, though he is, he's undeterred. And uh, he's as determined as ever. Um, Ray, before, I, I do want to get another word on Israel because that ceremony is taking place as we record this. Before I do that, though, it would be remiss of me not to mention that the head of MI5, Andrew Parker, has came has come out this morning in, in uh, London and talked again, issued a statement again about Russia and how Russia is seeking to undermine European democracies with all sorts of activities, you know, trying to influence elections, the usual stuff we've been hearing for um, the best part of the last two years now. 
he mentioned again the poisoning of the Skripals in Salisbury. Although I have to say, I think Alexander Yakovenko, the Russian ambassador to the UK, is brilliant in the way he's dealing with the UK media and putting them on the spot and demanding that they at least get some sighting of Yulia Skripal, some, you know, evidence that A, she exists, B, that she's here, that she's okay, that she's alive and well. Why why do you think Andrew Parker of MI5 has come out this morning? It's been covered by all the broadsheet newspapers here, all the TV and radio stations. Why has he come out with nothing new, just the same tired old rhetoric about Russia trying to undermine what's happening in Europe? Why today, do you think? Is it significant, well, you know, the timing? Uh, Ricky, it's, a, it's a magnificent diversion. Um, <clears throat> there, there's an old movie, Magnificent Obsession. Well, this is more our diversion. If you can blame Russia for everything from global warming to uh, the Skripal incident, uh, you know, you, you got something that most people brainwashed as they are will kind of say, oh, it's the Russians again, it's the Russians again. Um, what I object to really is the, uh, well, I'm, I'm foremost in my mind as my Palestinian brothers and sisters are being shot with butterfly bullets that exit with the size of a golf ball or even a, a tennis ball. What I object to is that uh, our media here not only uh, play this Russian thing up to the, the degree that they disguise what's going on in Palestine, but nobody knows. You know, uh, the CBS reports on uh, the, the uh, Israeli celebrations beginning tomorrow or today even for uh, the establishment of the Israeli state 70 years ago, right? Okay. Well, <laughs> I was, you know, I was eight years old then, right? And, uh, or maybe nine. And I remember great rejoicing in New York City, in the Bronx. We had, we had 30% of people in our neighborhood were Jewish. Okay. And it was wonderful. You know, these poor people, finally they had a place where they'd be safe. No one told me, Richie, no one told me that there were people already there. Yeah. They had been there for a millennium, like a thousand years, and that they were being thrown out, a lot of being killed, a lot of being exiled into places like Gaza, where they still are for generations. So, so you know, when when people quote all this kind of stuff and they mix stuff up, this CBS reporter said, well, you know, it's a celebration of the, terror, of the wonderful victory we had in the Six Day War in 1967. Well, I was on the radio yesterday, and I like to quote, in this very brief quote, Menachem Begin, who had been Israeli prime minister, and he made a speech, and he gave this text of the speech to the New York Times, and this is what he said, quote, in June 1967, we had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai approaches do not prove that Egyptian President Nasser was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him. Period. End quote. Okay? Look it up. New York Times, 1982. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that the Israelis are feeling, feeling so confident in U.S. support and British support and everybody else's support for uh, for what they're doing to the Palestinians, that they could say, look, you know, when we did our own Lebensraum, <laughs> yeah, we yeah. enlarge our own uh, little territory, well, you know, it we wasn't that we were threatened by those Egyptians. No, no, no. We decided to attack him. We must be honest with ourselves. Well, that may be the last time that a, a, that a Israeli prime minister uh, acting or or uh, former was honest with themselves but there it is and when the nakba is being celebrated by the palestinians well as you know richie that means disaster that means cat cat catastrophe and uh, you know to hear the israelis explain all this i heard the head of mossad who is a head of mossad about a uh, that's the israeli intelligence service about a decade ago and it was right after Netanyahu did this uh, ridiculous slideshow with fabricated, forged evidence that guess who did? Mossad did, okay? And what he was saying is that, yeah, then now we have this new evidence about Iran. Well, it's a crock, as we say in the Bronx. We proved it's a crock, 
And this, these documents have been available for a decade and proven to be spurious. So that's not what you see on TV. That's not what you hear in the New York Times or read. So it's a very, very terrible situation here. I don't think that that one appearance of the New York Times in 1982 has ever been repeated. But there it is. In 1970, 1967, we had a choice, says Menachem Begin. NASA wasn't going to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. We decided to attack him, period, end quote. And that's what they're doing as we speak now. Let me board. ask you this. Um, and this is meant with no disrespect. I said before we spoke, I'm not sycophantic. I'm a lot of things. I certainly am. I've got my faults, plenty of them, but I'm not a sycophant. I've always loved reading you, Ray. Um, you know, reading your articles, incredibly well briefed, thoughtful, thought provoking, and they're vital. And, and people should go to Ray's website. I'll post links to it all over Facebook and Twitter during this conversation tonight, which I'll be listening to as well. Why do you bother, Ray? And, and I, I mean no disrespect whatsoever. And, and I've asked some of your learned colleagues, some of the people that you've introduced me to in the past seven, eight years. The same thing. What's happening today is horrendous. I can't see how anything is going to stop it. I don't see any solution there. And why do you keep going? What motivates you? Well, Richie, uh, <clears throat> I'm glad you asked because this is fresh in my mind. Uh, we just celebrated in a little town in, in near Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Catonsville is the name of the town. And it's where... Uh, Dan Berrigan, a Jesuit priest, and his brother Phil, and, uh, and seven others burned draft cards and uh, uh, mounted the most significant and first big demonstration against the Vietnam War. Now, what's my point? Well, they're sitting in the only federal building in Catonsville, Maryland, and that happens to be the post office, right? <laughs> so, so Dan, in his, in his memoir, is, is going through his head. He's saying, now, I kept asking myself, uh, was this worth it? What was it, you know, was it, uh, we know we're going to be called commies, we're going to be called stupid, uh, you know, all kinds of, well, was it, with this act, major act, was it worth doing? And he says, well, you know, I came to the realization, it was a great blessing. He said, um, you know, this kind of act is worth doing because it's good. Results? Uh, results are not unimportant, but they are secondary to the goodness of the act. And uh, that's my Bible, okay? You do what you can, and you leave the rest in God's hands. Now, I had one little thing here, because see, he's got a wonderful sense of humor, and that is the sine qua non to keep going in this stuff, right? So he says, just then, the door opens, and this paradigm... <laughs> Uh, Dan's a poet, of course. He's a, the, this paradigm of an FBI inspector comes walking in with three others, and he looks at my brother Phil, who had his clerics on, you know, his Roman collar, and he points at him. He says, "You, you, I'm going to change my religion." And Dan writes, "No higher compliment could have come to my brother Phil." You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, it's not religion, it's justice. Uh, justice in the Muslim and the Jewish, and very, very, very strongly in the Jewish tradition. You know, uh, last thing I'll say is uh, when the first time I was in Palestine, we were treated to a briefing by the mayor of one of these hilltop, beautiful, uh, resplendent, uh, <coughs> green lawned uh, uh, settlements. And he was a, a rabbi, he was from Cleveland, right? <laughs> so one of my friends says, well, how do you, how do you, Explain these beautiful green laws when when the Palestinians down in the village there they had no running water. And you know what he said? He said, Deuteronomy 15.4, you shall have the promised land. Now, Richie, I only know about five verses from the Hebrew scriptures by heart, but I did know, <laughs> I did know Deuteronomy 15.4. And so I said, Rabbi, why did you read us only half? of Deuteronomy 15.4. He said, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, open the book. Read the whole thing. So we read it. You shall have the promised land so that there will be no poor among you. So he said, Rabbi, that sounds like a deal. I mean, that sounds like, a, oh, you might call it a, an agreement or even a covenant. Huh? 
so that there'll be no poor among you. What about those people at the bottom of the hill? Now, he, he, you know, immediately what they say is, oh, yeah, what'd you, what'd you do to the Native Americans? What did you do to the Indians? Okay, they're right about that. It is our original sin, racism. But, you know, now is now. We can do something about it. And I'm just terribly upset today because of what's going on on the border with Gaza. It's dreadful. You, you, what you talked about here was what about her? It's the most annoying thing in the world. What about, well, no, let's forget about what about for a second. Let's talk about what's happening today. Do you know, as we um, as we um, end this, thanks for coming on, by the way, short notice today. The BBC are covering it. And as we speak, they're saying 41 Palestinians are dead and nearly 2,000 wounded. But they're reporting on it, the BBC. And they seem to be report at least on the website, which is bbc.co.uk, it seems to be objective reporting which is not you know not not a regular thing with the bbc but they are reporting on it and they are telling people that unarmed men i mean the bbc story does say that unarmed people are being shot at by snipers so you know my question wasn't meant to be disrespectful at all ray i just wonder because you know you you, you've been on the road a long time you and others and um on a day by day basis a month by month year by year you see things getting worse and worse and I just wanted to ask you that great to yeah, let me just uh, add on. something here you know when my grandmother's time and my grandparents from Ireland of course Galway and Cavan and they used to talk about the the hedgerow teachers okay the English wouldn't let them get educated as you know better than I uh, Richie yeah. but but there were hedgerow, hedgerow teachers and had come and they didn't get into the newspapers. They didn't get into the radio if there was a radio at the time. But they taught the people. And as I travel around the country and, and I expect to be in Europe uh, shortly, uh, well, you know, hedgerow teachers did an awful lot for my people. Maybe they can help uh, others as well. Last thing here, I'm thinking, uh, I had an experience where a friend of mine whose uh, wife is studying to be a Lutheran priest uh, tells me a story about visiting the seminary, right? Okay, so they go in, and he's got his little three-year-old boy with him, okay? Now, the Lutherans, like the Catholics, uh, they have the corpus of Jesus. You know, they have the crucified Jesus on the cross there, you know, so it looks pretty gruesome. So this little kid had never seen that before. And he walks in the door, and he sees on the wall the crucified Jesus, you know, like like those pictures of Abu Ghraib uh, or Guantanamo. Yeah. And he looks at that, and he doesn't know anything. He's naive. So he says, Daddy, what happened? Now, that's the question for us to ask ourselves. What happened? Everything after 9-11 changed? Does that mean these, these wonderful people I used to work with now sit next to Gina Haspel and say, yeah, she's the greatest thing since sliced bread? It's very sad. So we need to ask ourselves, whether Christians or whatever, there's a symbol. What happened? What happened to this Palestinian Jew? He was a threat to the system. I don't believe that uh, his dad said, okay, Jesus, sorry, you got to die to uh, make sure the rest of the people can get to heaven. That, that is, he died because he was a threat to the system, the religious system and the imperial Roman system. So we can learn lessons from that. Uh, without being necessary believers of the whole nine yards, we have to ask ourselves, what happened to us? That's a really great place to leave it today. Just very, very briefly, Ray. By the way, it's raymcgovern.com, folks, but I'm going to tweet links out to it. Where are you going to be in Europe, by the way? Are you going to be in the UK, a UK at all? I always try to stop there to see a good friend of mine named Julian Assange, but uh, I... I'm almost in despair. He's nobody's allowed to see him now. No, that's uh, right. For six weeks, it's just awful. They may be, they may be planning to give him over to uh, the British and then to us. So, but I, I do hope to be in London. I'll be in Moscow, and I'll also be in Germany, and hopefully, I'll have a couple of days to visit my cousins in Ireland. Well, listen, safe travels. Um, glad you're on the mend after last week, and um, you, you know, greatness, Ray. It's a cliche, um, and, and the word legend is a cliche as well, but it's a word I like, and I think you are a legend. I think you're great, um, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, the world is better for having you in it, um, you and others. 
So look after yourself. Safe travels in Europe and um, maybe um, in the autumn we'll catch up again. Thanks again for everything you do. Yeah, well, you keep on keeping on too, Richie. You know, I've, I've, I've had people that uh, know what's going on because of you, so keep on keeping on. Ray McGovern on the Richie Allen Show recorded a little bit earlier today. It's-